Hello and welcome to Straight Talk Africa. I'm Heidi Adams. Thank you so much for joining me. This week, costly, confusing and time consuming. Welcome to air travel in the age of COVID-19. Pandemic protocols, restrictions and the high cost of COVID-19 tests are a headache for travellers and it's making commuting across Africa more difficult than ever before. Are the realities of post-lockdown travel helping or hurting African tourism? And what will it take to get visitors flocking back to the continent? We'll also discuss vaccine passports and why some African countries are ready to roll them out while others are saying no thank you. We'll have expert analysis and your opinion. Straight Talk Africa starts now. If you're planning to fly soon, be prepared to spend more money and more time at airports across Africa. COVID-19 restrictions and protocols are proving to be time consuming, confusing and costly for air travelers. Rules and restrictions are fragmented, differing from country to country, and the cost of COVID-19 tests, which are mandatory for passengers in most countries, can set you back hundreds of dollars. And it's that expense that has the International Air Transport Association concerned. It's urging Kenya to drop the price of COVID-19 tests for travelers, which stands at around 80 US dollars, to boost air travel and help the country's economy recover. Kamil Al-Awadi is IATA's Regional Vice President for Africa and the Middle East. He spoke with me earlier from Amman, Jordan, and explained why he is so concerned about the high price of COVID-19 testing at airports. For some unknown reason, there, there are very varied uh, costs to to the same test being done around the world, up to about four hundred dollars in some of the countries in Africa, which is uh, excessively high when you have other countries that are able to do it for fifteen or twenty dollars. Passengers that want to go and have a vacation would save up uh, a significant amount of money for that trip, and that includes tickets, hotels, food, and so on and so forth. The last thing they want to do if there's a family of five is to pay $2,000 for, for tests to be conducted um, prior to traveling. These costs are adding restrictions to passengers traveling or deciding to travel. It's becoming very costly um, for passengers to travel and therefore the, you know, the travel industry is not picking up as it should be. Why are these costs so high? You've mentioned varying costs for COVID testing in other countries. So they don't have to be this high, right? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, if, we, if we're just sticking to the PCR, there's alternative to the PCR, which is the antigen test. But if we're just sticking to the PCR, it's the same test being conducted in 193 countries. Why does it cost $20 in one country and then it costs $200 in another country and four hundred dollars in another country it doesn't make sense the test is exactly the same so that that only proves uh, to me that there are additional taxes for example added to some of these tests or um, laboratories are capitalizing on on the the situation on on corona and are trying to make uh, a quick buck really quickly um, on on from passengers and is this then part of the concern that travelers are being exploited and that COVID testing service providers and private companies, especially those with government contracts, could actually be profiteering here when they really shouldn't be? Absolutely. So, so if I want to widen that scope a little bit, I would say that, that uh, the aviation industry was impacted the hardest because of Corona. And then uh, the industry itself uh, is trying to recover by all means, by becoming more efficient and so on and so forth. But you look at restrictions and borders and that you need these tests and, and you have to quarantine and so on and so forth, making travel harder to restart. Plus the fact that charges for things like PCR tests, um, some of the airports have raised their charges, flying, parking, uh, companies have raised their handling fees and so on and so forth all impacting the aviation industry because the aviation industry needs to recover and so the prices of the tickets are going higher because it costs more 
And now the passenger is paying the price of the tickets plus additional um, tests like the PCR tests. So this is all uh, negatively impacting the restart of the aviation industry. Should there be a standard for COVID-19 protocols, and that of course includes testing, at all airports across Africa? And if so, what would you recommend those standards should look like and what should they be? Yes, there should, there should be a standard, and there is actually a standard. WHO developed one, and the ICAO, with the WHO and IATA, developed something called the CART, which, which actually describes how countries should handle um, all of the aspects of coronavirus, not specifically just for the testing, but quarantine and so on and so forth. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure why each country decides to uh, operate completely on its own. If you look at Europe now and how they've gone into the Green Pass and how they've united in an approach towards handling the tests and handling um, the, the coronavirus and travel during this pandemic, then you can see it's it's actually there and it's being done. It's why Africa and some other countries and different continents seem to want to handle it differently in a different manner, completely on their own, complicates, first of all, uh, travel. It really does. And every time I'm traveling in the past three or four months, I am always finding myself at the last moment trying to change something or download an app or fill up some extra information because it's just so complicated and it changes so regularly that nobody's able to, to, to understand it. Saying that, I, I'm not sure why Africa seems to be disjointed at this moment and not applying um, standards that or have already been issued by WHO or ICAO. Are vaccine passports going to become a permanent part of the travel world? I think so. I mean, if, you, if you've if you traveled lately in the last three or four months, the number of, as I said, the applications and paperwork and certificates and tests and so on, and then the passenger understanding what he needs to do is getting very complicated. IATA has developed the IATA travel pass, and that's predominantly to get the passenger in line with the airline, in line with the, with, with the government agencies from and to where he's going to travel. If you try to travel today, uh, can, can take up to four hours at the check-in desk, whereas it used to take less than five minutes in the check-in desk. This is the queues that are queuing up to verify their documentation and so on and so forth. It's not a practical way to travel. So you need to start digitizing um, your, your, your medical certificates and get airlines to accept this and then separate each state to accept that particular standard. And that was Camille al awadi IATA's Regional Vice President for Africa and the Middle East, speaking to me from Amman, Jordan. Vaccine passports could become a very real part of life, in some countries at least. Earlier this month, the West African nation of Togo rolled out digital vaccine passports as part of its COVID-19 immunization drive. The digital passport is free, it cannot be forged, and it can be used to commute across the country and abroad. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has announced his country would follow suit as that nation braces for a fourth wave of COVID-19 infections. But other countries, such as Nigeria, oppose vaccine passports, saying the move will trigger discrimination against poorer nations. The World Health Organization says around 60 million out of 1.3 billion people on the African continent are fully vaccinated. So how practical and how fair would it be to make Make vaccine passports a prerequisite for African travelers. I spoke to Lenias Wenda for some answers. Wenda is a health entrepreneur and the founder of Medicines for Africa. Her organization works to improve Africans' access to medicines and treatment. So Lenias, why this pushback when we are already using a type of vaccine passport or certificate in many parts of Africa? You know, the yellow booklet, here's mine from South Africa, to prove that you have been vaccinated against yellow fever. So why would a COVID-19 vaccine passport be any different? So that is primarily for, for travel. So, you know, Heidi, I understand there are a number of reasons be, be behind uh, President Ramaphosa's intent to introduce vaccines 
uh, vaccine passport. Well, firstly, South Africa just got out of a third wave, which has been driven by the Delta variant. And like all African countries, South Africa has been affected by the delays in getting vaccines in a timely manner. So not too many people have been vaccinated in South Africa and indeed uh, all over Africa on the continent, less than 3% of Africa's 1.3 billion people have received a vaccination to date. And the result of this low vaccination rate is that various restrictions such as shutdowns and curfews and bans on alcohol sales um, that we've had in South Africa have been really the only means to limit the spread of the virus and to reduce the burden on, on health systems. And these restrictions have made have come at a tremendous cost to the ordinary people and to the economies of, um, of, of Africa, including that of South Africa. I believe in Africa we are currently in a recession. So making sure that more people receive their COVID vaccinations remains one of the best tools to enable economies to fully open up to reduce the impact of a third of a fourth wave that we are expecting, um, and to prevent, of course, the emergency of new variants. So this requires that we have more South Africans vaccinated, and the goal uh, that uh, South Africa has is to have 40 million South Africans vaccinated by March 22. And, and really, people have nothing to fear. We know that these vaccines are safe and effective. Um, and prevent people, at preventing people from getting severe disease. They have been given to millions of people around the world and in the West where most people have been vaccinated. It's really people who have not received the vaccine that are ending up hospitalized with severe disease. The requirement for vaccine certificates uh, for international travel raises genuine concerns on the part of many African countries that vaccine certificates might be used by rich countries to prevent the entry of poor people uh, in their territories. Why would they have these concerns? Because we are already seeing a number of travel policies that are doing exactly that. So these are some of the concerns that are on the minds of African governments in terms of whether they find vaccine certificates acceptable or not. And Lenius, how hard or how easy would it be for an African country to implement vaccine passports? And I'm not just talking about travel here, but just for everyday life. It depends in what form you would um, want to, to implement them and what systems are in place in a particular country because every country is going to be different. If you're thinking of having digital passports, uh, which are probably the most practical given that most people in Africa have mobile, fax uh, mobile phones, according to the World Bank, about 650 million people are mobile users in Africa. But the question is that out of these mobile phones, how many are actually smartphones that would enable people to use digital um, certificates? Uh, and, and, and would the cost of data be a factor in terms of people's ability to actually make use of um, the, the, the digital vaccine certificate? The alternative, of course, is the is use of paper certificates, the little yellow, um, yellow fever vaccination card that we currently use. Um, it, it works. It's simple to implement, but the drawback there is that, you know, it is easy to, to counterfeit. So it, it really depends on, 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 on the country, what systems they have. It is the responsibility of regulators and law enforcement agency to make sure that those kinds of things aren't circulating in the market and people aren't being duped by these underground activities that, that are really very challenging to detect. Uh, you have a need, huge need for vaccines and you have a huge need for people to prove that they've been vaccinated, but not enough vaccines to allow people to, to actually get vaccinated. So this is usually organized crimes that, that are really international in nature, and um, it will continue to be a challenge as long as we have that gap of needs that are not being met. And Lenius, earlier, of course, I spoke to Kamil al Awadi. he's the Regional Vice President for Africa and the Middle East from IATA, about complaints of high cost of COVID testing at airports in Africa. And you've travelled 
into and inside the continent. From the work you do and the various African experts in the health and economic sectors that you speak to, do you get the sense that we'll see more restrictions and protocols for African travellers come into effect and remain that way for the foreseeable future? What you really notice traveling across borders in, in Africa at the moment is the high cost of testing or, you know, um, when traveling, uh, it, it's really a major concern. For example, the cost of a round trip ticket from Lagos to Monrovia has gone up from about 450 to $500 to about $700. And on top of that, you have to add an extra $300, which is almost half of your airline ticket for a mandatory COVID-19 COVID test, you know, for, for that round trip. So in the short to medium term, I think travelers are likely to continue to, to, um, to, to see the, the requirement for, for uh, proof of, of a negative test because we don't have any other way to control the spread of, of, um, COVID, of the coronavirus, you know, given that we don't have vaccines. So this is likely to continue. And my experience is that you have to provide the test, you have to continue to wear masks in airports. And even if I think we do manage to reach higher rates of vaccination um, coverage. I don't see this going away, these requirements going away anytime soon because, you know, vaccination reduces the chances of getting severe illness and ending up in hospital, but it does not prevent people from getting COVID and spreading it to others. Now, I want to ask you this as a traveller yourself. You've travelled to Africa from Europe and, of course, from one African country to another in recent months. What has that experience been like? Just give us an insight into a day in the life of a traveller during this time of COVID restrictions. The EU's current travel policy is that they recognise vaccination only for vaccines for people who have received vaccines that are approved by the European Medicines Agency. And so that means that unless you have received, you know, I mean, mostly in Africa, we have what? We have Covishield, which is being made by the Serum Institute of India, and which is also the vaccine that most African countries are receiving through uh, through the COVAX initiative, that, that global vaccine sharing initiative that, that has been sending most vaccines to Africa. The European Union will not recognize those, those the, you know, the vaccination with that vaccine. It's, it's, it's still very difficult, you know, for people coming from, from the region because the vaccination are so low and people would not either, you know, you would have a certificate with the vaccine that they don't recognize anyway, or they would not recognize your vaccination because you received it in Africa and not in Europe or with a vaccine that has not been approved by a European medicines regulatory agency. So it's incredibly complex to travel right now. And that was Lenias Wenda speaking to me from Harare, Zimbabwe. Wenda is the founder of Medicines for Africa and the host of the video and podcast series, Let's Talk About Health in Africa. Now, if you've traveled on the continent, what has the experience been like for you? We asked about that on social media. How have COVID-19 restrictions affected your travels this year? And these are some of the responses we received. Noon Makor from South Sudan says COVID-19 restrictions affected me a lot. I was supposed to study in Canada, but due to COVID-19, I couldn't. So sorry to hear that. Hope you get another chance at that. James Rui Majok, also from South Sudan, says without a vaccination card, you can't travel out of the country. Now, we also asked if you had the chance to travel to another African country. And if so, was it easy? Adetona Sugun from Lagos, Nigeria says, I travelled to South Africa and the screening for COVID-19 was time consuming, but it was necessary. All the same, I enjoyed the visit. Patrick Akukizibwe from Uganda says, I travelled to Rwanda and all I observed was determination to fight the pandemic and a resilient economy. Bosco Alieli, also from Uganda, says, in Congo, even for checking your coronavirus test documents, you have to pay $10. Thank you for your comments. These are very helpful and helps us get a picture of what's happening in different countries.
Still ahead here on Straight Talk Africa, how are COVID-19 travel restrictions affecting African tourism? And what will it take for visitors to come flocking back? My next guests say Africa has an untapped visitors market that could be the ticket to tourism's recovery. We'll have that discussion after the break. Back in a moment. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living. Right here on VOA. You're watching Straight Talk Africa on VOA. Welcome back. Before the pandemic, Africa had the world's second fastest growing tourism industry. In 2019, nearly 70 million international tourists visited the continent. Travel and tourism brought in about $180 billion to Africa's GDP. That's according to the United Nations. Now, that's of course not hard to believe when it comes to epic scenery, diverse cultural attractions, adventure and world-class cuisine, Africa practically sells itself. But pandemic lockdowns and restrictions, travel bans and grounded flights have devastated the continent's tourism industry. And now as economies try to recover from the pandemic, Africa's great tourist destinations are trying to woo visitors again. But will their efforts pay off? And do these challenging times present an opportunity to reinvent travel and tourism in Africa and address long-standing challenges? That's what I discuss with my guests. Kojo Bentham Williams is a senior communications expert in Africa at the UN World Tourism Organization. He's almost always on the road, but today he is in Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire. Also with us is Paul Frimpong. He's an economist with the Institute of Certified Chartered Economists, and he joins us from Ghana's capital of Accra. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Kojo, I'm going to ask you to start us off here. Please give us a picture of the overall impact of the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions. And here I'm talking travel bans, lockdowns and other sort of protocols on travel and tourism industries across Africa. I mean, uh, I think we don't really, I mean, we don't even need to go to just travel and tourism. But if you look at the, you know, the general impact of uh, the pandemic, then you realize that it's being, it, you know, it hits global sector and if you look at tourism is one of the most hit if not the most uh, hit sector and after what a month or two months people were uh, uh, you know companies enterprises were not able to withstand the the you know the effect you know of the covid so you saw hotels uh, you know laying over we saw a lot of people uh, you know losing their jobs so in terms of, I think we cannot believe at a point that tourism has done a lot of damage to the tourism sector. And rightly so in Africa, it's worse because of the fact that, first of all, we're still a developing country, like, and we develop, you know, we, I mean, uh, developing economies, and our a lot of our things is attached to tourism. And so if you look at the SMEs, which are the most hit part of tourism, it will tell you that our key source market are the European markets. And so looking at the UK, the US, et cetera, we're not traveling. And because we've not done much with respect to, you know, intra-African, you know, travel, it exposed us a lot. And that's when we go into uh, the discussions of how we can, uh, you know, uh, try to take the positives from the pandemic. We can look at how we cannot just rely on that. But in terms of livelihood, in terms of, you know, economic, in terms of jobs, it will take some time. If you look at the UNWTO's expert reports, which I think, I believe we will come to, is looking at 2024 as beginning to come back to pre-pandemic levels. So to give a sense of what has happened, I think we all know that it's done a uh, you know, devastating impact on African mm -hmm. economies. And if you want to look at travel in itself and lockdown, 
the least said the better. That's what I can I can say for now. Now, Paul, you're the numbers guy. Let's talk about money. What has the collective financial impact been on African tourism? And here I'm talking about lost jobs and revenue. And then how has that hit individual countries? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, as for those started by saying, um, the COVID-19 or any health crisis has a direct uh, impact on the entire economy structure. So with the, with the healthcare uh, being, being, being a bigger issue for the world and of course for Africa, uh, obviously economic activity were affected. Uh, and, and rightly said, uh, the tourism, uh, the hospitality value chain was the most hard hit uh, sector. Uh, because for, for example, we look at the financial service sector. I don't remember the last time I went to the banking hall. I virtually do everything uh, on my mobile app. I can buy anything online. So. Uh, sector and financial service sector, of course, will not be affected greatly as the tourism sector. From an entire value chain, so to the destinations, to hotels, to restaurants, to coffee shops, uh, to the laundry, so everyone in the value chain was affected because of this COVID-19. And globally, uh, you know, before COVID-19, we saw that uh, tourism was contributing about 10.4 to global GDP. Uh, that has half. I mean, since uh, we, we saw the hard uh, in Africa, we're looking at uh, in 2021 alone, of course, I think some of the reports were from the UN WTO, where for the works, uh, looking at uh, between uh, 173 to $250 billion in loss of revenue. And, and in 2021 alone, we've seen uh, over 7.2 or so million jobs being lost as a result of the uh, outbreak in the tourism sector. So for me, I think. It all boils down to the fact that, of course, in Africa, uh, unlike other parts of the world, we did not witness a scalability in terms of uh, the spread. Uh, we, at a point, we saw Europe was the epicenter of the virus, other regions also witnessed the same, but the African continent did not. Uh, then again, does that mean that we, we, we were economically well uh, as a result of it? The answer is a big no. And this is connected to the fundamentals in terms of the economic construct of the continent. So pre-COVID-19, uh, we, we, we all knew the trade levels uh, between the continent and, and uh, member countries as well for the rest of the world. I mean, China alone was offering about $200 billion in terms of trade bonds, uh, becoming the leading trading partner of the continent over, over 10 years in a row. Uh, Nigeria being the continent's largest export of oil, is exporting about a third of its oil to Europe. Uh, Congo and Angola were spending about 50% of its oil to China. So when we see an outbreak like what we witnessed, and these uh, regions or these markets were cut off, obviously we can all see the economic impact that these are having on the continent. So again, one critical aspect that we need to look at when we look at the tourism sector of, of the continent and most countries on the continent is most of the tourism-related uh, activity or initiatives or policies or programs of national governments are geared towards more of foreigners or foreign tourists than either domestic or intra-African uh, uh, tourists, which is a major key. So that in the event like what we are witnessing around the world in terms of the COVID-19 argument, at least to some extent, uh, our recovery could have been faster or we could have saved some jobs. Uh, looking at, like I did mention earlier, the, the, the level of scalability in terms of the spread of virus, which the continent actually uh, did well or uh, is fortunate or so that we couldn't witness as we've seen in other regions. We could have, you know, uh, been able to bounce back at a certain point, uh, even faster rate of recovery in the tourism sector. If uh, pre-COVID-19, we have been promoting or championing uh, uh, local tourism, uh, indigenous, you know, uh, being patronage of the, of the tourism sectors, and as well as intra, you know, uh, African uh, tourism. That could have saved us uh, than what we are witnessing now. Now, I want to turn to something we've been talking about throughout the show, the complaints from African travellers about the high cost of rapid PCR COVID testing at African airports, making it really expensive to travel from just one African country to another. IATA has asked Kenya to drop its costs for COVID testing. Uganda, we see, has dropped its cost somewhat. But then you see, for example, a country like Angola, which is adding a health fee in excess of 50 US dollars, and that's added at the time you buy your plane ticket. Now,
I can understand that countries want to let travelers in and at the same time, they have to take steps to control the spread of the virus. Kojo, how do you think countries should navigate this? I've traveled over uh, 15 countries since September 1st. And uh, significantly, uh, you realize that like just Paul said, uh, with respect to how the pandemic hit Africa, it wasn't the same in terms of magnitude like Europe. So you expected that we would shore up. And if, if, I mean, if you may use the word, uh, you know, money travels better. But we went blank, you know, blanket in, you know, in terms of travel bans. Having said that, you realize that in my own country in Ghana, that's where I come from, you know, originally, we were charging 150 US to do an antigen test. Okay. Now, we all didn't know the, the, you know the pandemic or the virus better. We had the beta, we had the delta, and, and, and all of that. And if you ask people to do your, your, your protocol was to have people have a PCR before boarding the plane. Now, there is over 90% evidence that in the plane, it was difficult for, 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 I mean, for the virus to survive. Okay, and you, you arrive at the destination and you are supposed to pay a whooping 150 US dollars, which in some instance can be about one, uh, about 40% or even 50% of your budget. Then you are throwing everything out of gear. So you realize that, yes, we know, but to the extent that which that we're doing that, okay, I want to travel from Johannesburg to Accra. The gold standard was PCR. I did a PCR in Joburg. But I have to now arrive in Accra and do an antigen for 150 US. Then when leaving Accra, um, I do another test that will cost you so much. So it, beginning, we all understood that obviously, yes, we're trying to avoid the in the pandemic. But it was so consistent that Ayata said that you have to eliminate this high cost of testing. Then the UNWTO, like you said, as where I work from, the Secretary General Zura Fulikas, we had said that we have to coordinate, we have to collaborate. Because if you don't coordinate, I'm traveling from Accra. And I had an instant specifically to myself to I go to destination. And I was told that my test had, uh, had uh, expired over two hours. Now I was caught up in a situation whether to be allowed in or do another test. So it ballooned the cost. All right. And Having in mind a continent that was suffering from artificial uh, uh, barriers in traveling in the continent. And as Paul rightly said, we never had the same issue. So right from the onset, it was as if to say that, okay, yeah, we had COVID, but we didn't connect to the, you know, the continent as much. But we are making it even difficult for it to restart the thing. So we went the blanket way of uh, instituting travel bans. And look at the irony of when Kenya, South Africa, other countries were saying that they have to get off the, the red list of the UK. Can you imagine what is the, what is this, if you look at the UK market, yes, we talk about tourism in terms of the spend, but if we are you know, beginning to talk about intra-African travels, imagine we have a potential 1.2 billion population and I have to look for visa to travel to South Africa. You know, likewise, in you know, South Africa traveling to Ghana. So you look at all of that and you think that if we are to do, uh, we have to restart tourism and have tourism, you know, uh, build back better, like we are saying, we cannot have that situation. The pandemic provided Africa the opportunity to close all these barriers. But unfortunately, we went with the flow. Now, if you compare the UK market and building Africa together, I mean, the least said, the better. So my point is that until we will get, we're making travel even more significantly very expensive. Now I pay a COVID test, a minimum of COVID test about 300 US to travel, having in mind that things have changed, policy power have changed. So we're not doing ourselves any good if we are still sticking. As we speak now, I was in Lumbashi, I'm back in Cote d'Ivoire. The fact that I have to show in Cote d'Ivoire and South Africa, obviously, countries have adjusted their protocols that you show a PCR. But what they, can, they are not even doing is to be very innovative to have a single platform to ensure that also to eliminate uh, you know, counterfeit results, 
is to say that we are having a, you know, a seamless path on that we can share. So the main point that I'm saying is the fact that we cannot use COVID to, if you like, uh, um, uh, 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 restart tourism in the point that you said, okay, people have to pay X amount of money, where it's proving that even when you have the gold standard of uh, testing as in PCR, you have to arrive in Accra and pay one to two dollars. So, in my point of view, we are not taking advantage of restarting and building back better. And it has exposed us to the extent that why do we have to cry to say that uh, South Africa, Ghana, Cabo Verde, uh, I mean, Kenya ought to be off the list of the UK for us to see that we can restart tourism? So, I'm just reinforcing the point that. The UNDB2 has said that until we are bold as, as countries to say that we have to coordinate but also collaborate to get people traveling again, we'll be back to the same point and I wish that we are not back to saying that, uh, uh, you know, Africa have to restart something. And I don't think that where we are going now, we have the opportunity to restart tourism better, uh, you know, in this particular point, because I'm spending a lot of money with respect to testing. And I'll have more from my conversation with Kojo Benson Williams and Paul Frimpong after the break, as well as the results of our audience poll on vaccine passports. And later on, we'll show you where you can go skiing in Africa. Yes, you heard that right. Stay with us. From around the world, let's go. Welcome back. We're talking about the impact of COVID-19 restrictions on travel and tourism across Africa and what it will take for the industry to bounce back. Here's more now from my conversation with my guests, Kojo Bentham Williams and Paul Frimpong. Kojo, you know, I always wonder about this. Is traveling between African countries not something that we should have made easier by now? I mean, we can easily travel between African countries and regions outside of the continent. Why in 2021 are we still talking about how difficult and cumbersome it is to travel by air from one African country to another? You have national carriers running to their state to get to be protected, you know, from... Uh, if you want to call it uh, governance issues. Now, if you do that, and aviation is a very thin profit market area, that if you don't manage yourself well, then you're losing out on things. If we are to still protect our national airlines and not think of strategic alliance, then it would be difficult for us to be, you know, bring the continent together because the optics of just having an airline doesn't, you know, doesn't work in, in the aviation industry. We have to understand that. Look, airlines are not allowed to even fly, for example, Fit Freedom Ride. So you see Ethiopian Airlines is the strongest on the continent, well managed. Uh, but because there was a, a, you know, a point in case that they wanted to fly from, I think, Nairobi to Brussels or something, and Kenya Airways, uh, from what you read from the media, uh, were behind in terms of allow, not allowing them to do so. So if, if we want to protect our national airlines, it comes at a cost. That's, that's my point. The second thing is that, look, if, if we've learned anything at all, if there's something that, I mean, we all learned in terms of the silver lining, is for us to collaborate and partner to work better. Assuming I'm not a Ghanaian, to arrive in Accra, I, 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 to have a visa on arrival, I needed to have applied earlier before. There should be seamless processes, like in Rwanda. You can go online, put in the processes, and allow allow you to arrive earlier. So these are the things that if you don't eliminate, which I call artificial barriers, it will hinder our progress in terms of Africa, in terms of uh, you know uh, productivity, in terms of tourism, and we will come back and not building a resilient tourism sector in Africa. Because remember that the SMEs, the small, micro, and medium scale enterprises are the backbone of the tourism sector. And for them to survive, 
they need a very strong sector. And that will mean that changing our ways how we consume tourism, how we do tourism, how we, we try to build resilient and robust system. Because we can never come back again and say that we want another pandemic to come before we can be able to do things right. So in my opinion, we need to take a cue from what has happened with the COVID and to be able to see that artificial barriers like visas, like uh, air connectivity, airlines not allowed to, you know, to connect. I have to go to Europe or Middle East, just like Paul said, to back, come back to the continent. We're not going to go anywhere. And the Secretary General of the World Tourism Organization has said that leaders ought to take bold decisions to ensure that we save livelihoods, we save jobs, we say because tourism is on the line, and we've already wiped that 4.5 trillion, you know, contributions to the world economy because of COVID. Paul, are there new innovative ways for tourism sectors to bounce back, or are some jobs just gone for good? Can some losses be made up for, and are there losses that will just never ever be recouped? Well, I think I think the first thing that we need to look at is the diversification. Uh, of the of tourism in terms of the clientele, uh, which I did mention earlier that in most countries on the continent, uh, most of the tourism uh, policies and programs are designed to attract uh, foreign tourists instead of focusing on our domestic. So here, uh, I think governments uh, and the various agencies and stakeholders that are involved in the tourism sector have a role to play. Again, I think on the continent, uh, if you look at Africa, I believe that we've not been able to utilize or develop the full potential of our tourist uh, our destinations. And I think that has to be one of the key things that we need to put much work or investment in. Because tourism is you having something uh, historical, something uh, monumental, something exciting, uh, something uh, meaningful that people are willing to pay uh, to come and have the weather for leisure, maybe you have a uh, nice uh, uh, beaches that you've been able to uh, properly uh, structure. Um, it could be safari, it could be some museums, it could be some uh, natural uh, uh, resources that we've been able to capture. So in Ghana, we have uh, uh, such you know instances. We have what we call when you go uh, places to visit in Ghana, you have also some of these natural uh, uh, resources that we converted to tourist sites. So I think. We need to be strategically and, and conscious and repeatedly invest in new uh, tourist destinations. And I think each member country on the continent have that capacity and that potential to be able to do that. And of course, in terms of our communication and, and our branding uh, on how we want to, and of course, your countries like South Africa is doing amazing well. I look at uh, uh, even Morocco, in Marrakesh, they have a lot of campaigns that they're running. Of course, we have in Kenya, they're doing a lot of work in the, in the safari. So I think if we can uh, be able to uh, promote and, and, and do more of our visibility and, 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 and communicate well around uh, some of the destinations that we have, I think that would be a way for us in terms of our recovery. And like I did mention, a government investment in, 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 in designing and identifying new tourist destinations is very key. And of course, uh, we need to look at what we mentioned earlier, which is air connectivity and travel costs, uh, to make sure that we're able to uh, invest and, of course, ensure that uh, people have you know, access to be able to travel and you know, reduce the cost of uh, traveling uh, to, to, to tourist destination. I think that could be one of the key things that we can do uh, in this direction. But most importantly, I think one of the key things that we have to look at is diversifying the content base and not to do uh, tourism promotional activities geared towards uh, uh, foreigners. In Ghana, uh, in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of government related projects or programs that you can actually see that it's geared towards uh, uh, foreign tourists. So we saw what we call uh, the year of return. Uh, we've seen what we call beyond the return. Obviously, all these programs, we saw the government uh, agencies are uh, doing more. Uh, programs in, in, in Europe and in, in, in America just to ensure that it would attract uh, these tourists to come, which is which is key, of course, if that needs to be done. But I think when we can do our work domestically, I think that would be a way for us. And of course, talk about a visa uh, uh, issues, because once you want to ensure that uh, member countries or people in countries on the continent can travel 
are between freely, then of course we need to work on our visa-related issues. And I think in, 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 in so doing, we can help to recover and bounce back quickly from this, this crisis. Kojo, are you seeing countries that have successfully helped their tourism sectors recover? Look, I think that, yeah, I mean, for if you look at the uh, expect um, reports that the UNWTO released with respect to when tourism will come back, you realize that we're looking at 2024 in coming to pre-pandemic levels. And that's that's what we got from the experts. Now, uh, if you look at the vaccination drive, uh, of course, Africa is still yet to receive um, I mean, more than 10 percent. The truth also ought to be mentioned or ought to, ought to be made that Africa don't have the same level of risk compared to Europe and Americas. And I mean, I mean, Asia, like Paul alluded to earlier, tourism is an end product. And tourism itself is a transversal sector. So if you are having a, a country that you cannot connect and he knows in from, you know, as we speak now, traveling from Accra to Cape Coast, which is supposed to be the hotspot of tourism, it will take you uh, a minimum of about three, four, five hours in traffic in Kaswa. Okay. Now, if we cannot do things that makes it seamless for people to travel and the travel time is still extended, then people cannot do that. Now, uh, the I mean, the tourism minister ought to uh, have the buy-in or the finance minister, foreign affairs, uh, I mean, home affairs, et cetera, to ensure that they listen to it. And if you look at Africa, tourism ministers are going through a lot to, in, I mean, to be heard. This is the fact. So for us to ensure that we, 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 we begin tourism, uh, I mean, uh, revival on a positive note, let us not make regional and domestic tourism a new jack uh, project. We have to make it part of our uh, the structure of, of our economies. And if you look at even Africa, Southern Africa and Eastern Africa are positioning tourism as a key economic driver. These are the crust of the matter. So for us to begin, let's make intra-African travel, eliminating artificial barriers, I mean, I mean, for this, I mean, till this day and age, you have to apply for you to travel to a fellow African country. Yet, we are saying that when you are coming from Europe or Americas, some African countries have it that you don't need a visa. All right? But if I'm coming from Ghana to South Africa to, to DRC, some other country, I need a visa. So these are the key things of it. Again, if we don't build a resilient and robust sector, Look, we have to forget about it. And may we never come to this point. Because it's always e easier said than done to say that, yes, we'll travel. But West Africa is the most difficult, con I mean, sub-region to connect. At some point in time, to go to Dakar, you have to travel, you know, around some part of the continent. So what I'm saying in the nutshell uh, is the fact that let's make tourism a core priority because the people-to-people -people sector we call tourism is the only sector that can connect and not just, uh, you know, saying that we can just use the numbers. So uh, in my, you know, in my uh, final point on restarting tourism, let's make domestic tourism, let's begin to invest in, in you know, infrastructure. Let's be innovative, like Paul said. If you look at what is happening right now, I was still uh, believe that, I mean, South Africa picked up late, but remember that they held the, the African you know, Travel and Tourism Summit. And let me make this point. We realized that people were saying that people cannot meet. If you cannot meet now, how do you then position yourself in terms of uh, able to do things? That, I mean, the pandemic is not good. I mean, the pandemic is not living now. It's going to be with us for some time. So we, you have to be bold in taking the bold decision. I know that you know, uh, I mean, you have to have a good marriage between uh, a health, you know, sanitary uh, protocols and what you are trying to do. But at the same time, let us have the confidence and have the, uh, if I may put it in the way, be bold to make a decision that put the continent or put the region in a way to start. Because Africa was not the worst affected sector. And as Paul said, we managed the, the, you know, the pandemic well. But can you imagine right now, we are now calling for us to be to be taken off, you know, uh, uh, the travel list. But if you look at Rwanda, if you look at Cabo Verde, if you look at 
if in Ghana, I mean, if I'm here, I'm in Cote d'Ivoire now, we are doing measures. It's not the best that you can get, but there's some steps that African countries are taking yeah. within the continent that we can align ourselves. We can align and we should eliminate this draconian, uh, uh, what's the name, policies of still keeping, as we speak now, even if we are vaccinated, you don't know whether you still have to pay the COVID test or not. In Europe, as we speak now, if you are uh, fully vaccinated, you don't need any testing going to Europe, I mean, in the UK or, I mean, Netherlands or something. But as we speak now, if I have to come back to Ghana, I have to still take a PCR test, I'm fully vaccinated, and pay a 50 US dollars at the airport. So until we clear that, and until we forget that is a way to make money, we are not going to head, we are not going to promote the Africa that we want. The 2063 may just be a mirage. Okay, gentlemen, vaccine passports, good idea, bad idea. Paul, you first. Well, I, I think, I think you know, uh, when we look at these uh, vaccine uh, passports, I mean, of course, uh, me myself have not traveled since the outbreak. I think my last talk that I did was in March 2020. I went all the way to Bangladesh. I came back, and I think three days later, I got, uh, recorded its first case. And since then, I've not done any travel. And as as you mentioned, I think uh, it has now become a requirement for you to travel uh, fully vaccinated. And even that, you're still required to do a PCR uh, test. Of course, I mean, uh, there's one school of thought, uh, which is, uh, which is to serve as an incentive for those that have uh, decided you not know, to take the vaccine to be able to do that. Of course, we all know that uh, the more people we have vaccinated, the higher our chance of getting hold of this virus. Uh, being vaccinated necessarily does not mean that you are immune. Uh, of, of, of that cannot be established as of now. Uh, whether when you are vaccinated, that means you cannot uh, contract or spread the virus. That cannot be established as of now. But of course, it, it ensures some level of safety. And so one school of thought is that with the vaccine now available, you, one way or the other, do not have an excuse to not take it and putting all of us at risk. So it could be argued that, you know, in fact, that has been the major incentive for ensuring that as many people as possible can get vaccinated. And therefore, to travel, we demand that at least you have uh, at least, I think it started off in some of the Scandinavian countries where they even have an online portal where you have to uh, upload your, your vaccination card or vaccination number for verification uh, before before you are allowed to travel. And I think uh, for, for most who are against, of course, uh, you think that it, 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 it's more of very discriminatory uh, in a way. Uh, because we all see the negative connotation that this virus has on, 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 on people, on regions. And of course, it's a result of that, that even, uh, even when you're vaccinated, you're still being questioned as to whether the, your testing method is, is valid, whether uh, we can trust your results or not. And that's all the blacklist that we saw uh, with the UK, uh, uh, countries like Ghana and Kenya putting on it on, 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 on on the blacklist that even when you're vaccinated from these countries, they still want you to go through uh, quarantine and, and restricting you access and all of that. So uh, for me, I think I'll, I'll go with the school of thought that yes, we should have uh, an innovative way of, of, of ensuring that we get as many people, as many people as possible to get vaccinated. But to use that as a yes, to, uh, as, as a means of traveling, I think that will in itself uh, hinder uh, 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 and, and affects even uh, this same tourism sector that we are talking about. I think there must be a way where, uh, uh, vaccinated or not, uh, you should be able to have access to uh, markets or travel to places that you want to travel to uh, with various uh, measures that can be put in place to ensure that you're traveling safe and that you're not at risk to uh, the place that you're traveling to. I think that would be a major breakthrough for us than to restrict solely that without being vaccinated, you cannot travel. And I think that would be a major challenge uh, and, you know, even compound the economic effect that we are having of this pandemic. Kojo, South Africa's Cyril Ramaphosa says vaccine passports are coming. Um, other African countries, of course, say it's not a good idea. What's your take? 
And we've seen in the last few weeks and months how African countries, even with resources, are not able to assess I mean, the vaccines. Yes. Okay, so we'll look at that. And it, it, it means that if you find yourself in some part of the world, not because you don't want to, you know, I mean, get vaccinated, but because of, by virtue of uh, you know, accessibility, you are not able to get that. And that shouldn't deprive you of traveling for business, family, or whatever you are going to do. So I don't uh, wholly go for that. But like Paul said, we should have a structure and a way that uh, eliminate discrimination. There's, you know, vaccine hesitancy. And you ask yourself, I mean, coming back to your first point, is what we call vaccine nationalism. That we are saying that countries now saying that, okay, you have to even have a specific vaccine before you can travel. Where did it start? The same countries that were, were donating vaccines to developing countries now are saying that you cannot use that. So we have, to, it has to be a good marriage between understanding people who don't have access to the vaccines and then how we can also uh, enrich in herd immunity or ensuring that everyone is safe, we can be able to come back to some you know, level of normalcy. So probably I'll not stick up yes or no, but I'm saying that let's have a fair you know, balance to ensure that no one is left behind. And if you care to know as well, this year's World Tourism Day celebration, which happened in, in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, was to say that tourism for inclusive growth and the fact that we should carry everyone along to ensure that we are beginning to restart tourism in a better way. Gentlemen, thanks for spending some time with us. Kojo Bentham Williams and Paul Frimpong, we're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining me and thank you for your time. Now, we conducted a poll among our social media audience and we asked if you think vaccine passports are necessary to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. Here are the results. 40% of you said yes and 60% said no. When you think skiing, Africa probably doesn't come to mind, much less Southern Africa with its deserts and baking hot sun. But in the mountain kingdom of Lesotho, skiers and snowboarders are hitting the slopes. Africa has five mountain ranges with enough seasonal snow to make potential slopes, but the Afri Ski Resort is one of the two in Southern Africa. And whether you're a professional skier or snowboarder or still finding your way around the slopes, these resorts give visitors a chance to experience an African winter wonderland. It is my first time here, um, but it's something very different. Uh, my knees and feet are paining. <laughs> um, I broke a sweat, you know, unexpectedly, but it was mad fun. Um, yeah. I haven't skied before, but it's been it's been challenging and fun at the same time because I haven't done something this spontaneous, you know. So I just decided to try skiing for the first time and I loved it. I loved it. Yes, it isn't, it isn't much, but uh, people come in and have a whole lot of fun. Uh, let alone, for, for me as a local, I don't have to fly out of here yet. I've got a vacation right here. Wow, it's so great to see those visuals again. South Africans have been enjoying those slopes for years. On the next edition of Straight Talk Africa, we'll explore the multiple waves of the global African diaspora. Diasporan communities are found in nearly every part of the world. But how has their connection to the continent changed over generations? We'll also profile young diasporans making their mark in American politics. Be sure to join me, Heidi Adams, on the next Straight Talk Africa. And that is a wrap for this week. Thank you to all of our guests and all my VOA colleagues who contributed to this week's program. Thank you for always watching and always listening. Until the next time, goodbye.